Right. Good afternoon. We are going to go ahead and get started with the Public Safety Committee meeting uh, for Tuesday, June 21st. Um, the first item on the agenda is an update uh, from the Grand Rapids Police Department. Sorry for a little bit of an audible here, but we have um, consolidated all of the presentations and I'll, I'll lead off with just a little bit of an overarching um, set of commentation, uh, set of comments. So uh, ha happy to be here. I'm Kate Barron's deputy city manager for those of you that I have not had a chance to meet yet. Um, and we just wanted to start off um, recognizing that there have been uh, quite a, th a few things happening in our community um, that directly touch on the, the work of the Public Safety Committee, and we wanted to provide a little bit of context for the three updates you're going to have today. Um, so obviously, uh, safe community is one of our strategic plan priorities, and it's something that we have been working on as an organization and as a community for a number of years. The strategic plan itself built on work that had been done prior to uh, the adoption of the strategic plan. And then we are furthering that work that is uh, set out in the strategic plan through a number of department level plans and community partnerships and that we will be reporting out on periodically to this body. And those are the police strategic plan, obviously the Office of Oversight and Public Accountability, the Aspen Institute work, which uh, did an in-depth presentation at the Committee of the Whole today. We are hearing from our partners through in Cure Violence, and we are receiving, and you will be receiving a Safe Alliances for Everyone Safe Task Force update today as well. Um, so in the future, we are trying to organize our updates to this body around these major areas um, that the city is e either leading or partnering with, uh, and these particular actions that we hope will lead to a feeling of safety for all in our community. So you will periodically be hearing about public safety department operations, and, and you do that routinely now from the police department, fire department, and office of emergency management, and oversight, office of oversight and public accountability. Uh, we will also bring you updates um, as needed on other city department operations and activities. Again, uh, there is work done around safety and safe community in a number of our departments. Some uh, won't come to this particular committee. For example, uh, things that happen through our mobility department to lead to safety in our streets for pedestrians and bicyclists, that has a different channel. But there are things that we do in other department operations that are directly related to um, this safe community outcome. For example, parks operations, um, things that we're doing in our parks to ensure people's safety while they're enjoying those public spaces. And we will be bringing periodic updates about those things to the committee. And then obviously our community partnerships. Um, so before we get into the more in-depth uh, presentations that were prepared for you today, I did want to just give you a couple of high-level updates of things that are uh, happening both inside and outside the city to, again, respond to some of the more recent incidents we have had downtown and throughout our city and how we are trying to uh, ensure that people both are safe but feel safe in all of our public spaces. Um, and the chief will speak a little bit more to these specific police department activities, uh, but I did want to pause and talk about some of the work we've done in the downtown in particular. Oh, sorry, I think I just went backwards. Uh, in the downtown in particular, um, we have been meeting with a group of stakeholders downtown and uh, recently DGRI expanded their um, private security contract. So we now have private security supplementing some of the work downtown, particularly in the late night hours, to help add to that feeling of security um, and able to get information to the police department as needed. Uh, we also are acquiring additional assets, the mobile camera assets that have been very helpful, and we have deployed that both downtown and um, during the daytime at MLK Park most recently. And those things help us uh, respond to activities um, and pursue those through to arrest and prosecution if need be. 
Uh, I also want to hit on some of the parks department activities uh, to date. We've had several uh, incidents in our parks and want to uh, update this committee on things that we are doing to respond to that. So um, some of this continues work that happened last summer. So there are security gates at uh, 6th Street and Canal Parks. We do see those broken, not infrequently, uh, but we do repair those and, and operate those to ensure that the parks are not used overnight. Uh, we also have a septet analysis that was done last year at many of our parks, and we have been implementing those recommendations, and that includes upgraded lighting, installation of security cameras, tree trimming, and other things to increase transparency and visibility throughout the parks. We are also adding uh, additional night security to our downtown parks. That is something we did last year and we are doing again this year, as well as having a, a parks ambassadors program. So ultimately, we hope to have 12 parks ambassadors. We are currently staffing up. And as you are hearing in many sectors of the economy, taking us a little bit longer than we would like to staff up. We have six right now. Uh, so those are, I just wanted to highlight a few of those things that we are doing to enhance a uh, feeling of safety in our parks. We also have other activities that uh, we are pursuing. One is the Grow 1000 program. So again, ways to engage people, uh, engage youth in particular when they're out of school. We are also re- launching our uh, zoning septet ordinance. So prior to the pandemic, the commission adopted a septet ordinance for particular businesses to increase transparency and to, um, again, deal with issues in and around particular types of businesses. We suspended enforcement of that ordinance during the pandemic because it it impacted small businesses that were very impacted by uh, COVID as well and those closures. We are now relaunching enforcement of that ordinance. We will be communicating to the impacted business owners. There will be a period of time to come into compliance before we start with the civil enforcement, but that is something that we are re-engaging in, again, to accomplish our safe community objectives. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to uh, the police chief, who will start with the Grand Rapids Police Department update, and then we have the Cure Violence update and Safe Task Force for you as well tonight. Thank you. Or Very good. this afternoon. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Barons. Thank you for giving me the time to speak today. Mr. Fain, last time I was here, you asked me a question I didn't know the answer to. And I promised you an update. That was a question about High Capacity Magazine. So uh, I made a trip actually recently to uh, First uh, gun store in Michigan, and it turns out that you can buy a very high capacity uh, drum magazines, uh, 50 9 millimeter rounds, right off the shelf here. So there are no uh, rules against that in the state of Michigan. Fortunately, um, unlike the jurisdiction where I uh, previously served, we haven't seen the uh, impact of fully automatic weapons here uh, in. Uh, Grand Rapids, and I hope we do not, but uh, it was an interesting thing to learn. That is the current state of the law here. Um, as well, uh, Commissioner Jones, you asked for an update on, uh, on crime in general, and I intend to uh, provide that on a regular basis to this committee. So um, take a look at uh, a few slides here. And as I said, uh, from when I uh, did begin, violent crime will be my number one priority while I'm police chief here. Uh, fortunately, as you can see from 2021, our homicides increased by a uh, total of four. Right now we're sitting on 11 homicides, and we broke it down by um, what you can see, gun-related homicide, non-gun-related homicides. Um, 2020, of course, was an outlier in the city with 38 total in the year, but at this point in time in 2020, we were at the number uh, of 17. Um, last year we made progress, but this year, as you can see, there is an increase. As well, um, there's an increase, a steady increase in ag assaults. Now, these numbers are a little bit misleading because this is just through the month of May. And as you'll recall, uh, the murder of George Floyd took place at the month of May, and the, uh, the summer of January 2020 was when uh, violence increased generally across the entire country. So uh, next time I update you, I'm sure these numbers will look differently. Also included in this, you can see um, uneven numbers of auto thefts. Now, um, since May 1st of this year, We've seen 122 either attempts or successful thefts of Kias and Hyundais in the city of Grand Rapids, which is an astronomical number for that. And uh, we have released uh, two actually um, community alerts on the subject. We are working with our auto theft task force to, to take actions to encourage citizens to be uh, more conscientious in uh, steps that they can take to prevent their vehicles being stolen, uh, but I paired them together because oftentimes stolen vehicles are used 
in the commission of other crimes, including shooting. So it's something that's of uh, great concern to us. And as I've said before, um, you know, the police department is not the entire, uh, the entire answer to the crime problem. There, there's a lot going on. We have, I'm excited to hear from our partners here at Cure Violence um, and other partners across the city, but uh, certainly we're an important part of the solution. And um, not so long ago, the National Institute of Just, Justice published uh, some research on de deterrence, which focused on, uh, found that when potential criminals have a certainty of being caught, it is a powerful deterrent. So increasing the percentage of the cer certainty is uh, one of my priorities in working with the city's Office of Communications to, yes, Commissioner? Yeah, one second, Chief. Uh, I just, is there the significance of the, the, the Kias and Hyundais? I don't, you know, sure. the, yeah, that's a great no question, and I'll tell you. No friends that drive Kias and Hyundais, but don't seem like the most uh, sexy appealing cars. Yeah. Stolen, so. <laughs> so when I was a, when I was a kid or when I was a new cop in 2000, you could, you could jump in almost any car uh, with a flathead screwdriver, pop the column off, uh, not that I did it, but uh, but I knew I knew how to do it. You could pop the column um, and using a flathead screwdriver. You could uh, start the vehicle and drive it away in a matter of uh, you know 90 seconds, two minutes. As technology improved and security devices in car, as uh, you know, cars became smarter. They've got chips in them, et cetera. That uh, became a thing of the past, unless you own a 2012 to 2021 Hyundai or Kia. And you can still, with a flathead screwdriver, do that. And I'm not talking out of school. It's uh, if you Google it, I'm sure you can find it on YouTube. And a youth, literally across the country, have realized they can go on social media and they can get a quick tutorial. And any one of you with a flathead screwdriver could go down and find this vehicle and and steal one. So the word is out, and that's that. That's the significance of that. Now, um, interesting. When, when I was young, there was a thing called the club which or a car safety device, which kind of went, went by the way, said it's back in vogue now if you own those, uh, and we encourage that or any other sort of alternative security measure for a vehicle. Yeah. Thank you um, for that. Thank you, sir. So, uh, but I was, I, I wanted to, I mentioned the thing about uh, get the certainty of punishment is a clear, uh, a, a deterrence. And uh, it's important for us because although we've had 11 homicides this year, we've already uh, solved Oh boy, my math is off. Six of them, so, and we've got. Um, we will have over a ninety percent homicide clearance rate in the coming weeks, uh, um, assuming something drastic doesn't happen. Uh, our investigative team is exceptional. National average is fifty-five percent homicide clearance rate. Last year we had a seventy-eight point nine percent. And messaging out as these uh, cases uh, are brought to court. Um, by the communications department messaging out that if you commit a serious crime in Grand Rapids, you will be caught and you will be brought to justice is very important for us. So you can see too, um, uh, the number of firearm arrests that we've been making, they were um, you know, an average 120, 113 in uh, 2019 and 2021. A very motivated and engaged group of officers got it up to 258 last year. And one of my worries following the uh, April 4th shooting of Patrick Leoya was a thing that in policing we call deep policing. And that's when officers get uh, unmotivated. They, um, you know, respond more like a fireman. They just respond to the job. They take a report and they move on. So keeping the officers engaged, trying to keep the morale up is something that's uh, always on my mind. But as you can see from these numbers, they've made 255. They've recovered 255 illegally possessed firearms this year. So they're really out there. And each one of those incidents, when you arrest someone who's in possession of a legal firearm, that is a very dangerous situation. So these officers have not held back. They are, um, they're giving it their all for the city of Grand Rapids. They're showing uh, excellent results and uh, I'm very optimistic uh, of um, our efforts moving forward. The last thing on this list is um, DICE, which may be the subject of a future uh, public safety committee meeting on its own. It's uh, DICE is an acronym for Data Informed Community Engagement. And what that is is engaging, uh, embracing the concept of uh, community policing in a way that when we identify through data a neighborhood in the city which is in need of enhanced resources from the police department because of an increase in violent crime, instead of just going through and saturating the area, area with officers, making numerous car stops, et cetera, we're going to uh, go out and meet with the community, sit down with the neighborhood associations and say, this is the problem that we see. Here's the data 
that we've made our determination on. And uh, here's the solutions that we're proposing as far as enforcement efforts. And we want to hear what you're comfortable with and what you think the police department can do for you. Uh, we have a meeting on that, uh, a data meeting to identify those, those first groups of neighborhoods coming up. And uh, I'm excited to see that uh, as we move forward. Um, some other updates, um, as uh, Ms. Barron's mentioned, we uh, got approval for uh, two additional camera trailers. Uh, very excellent deterrence when you see uh, a group of, uh, I mean, a, a trailer with an extended telescoping pole with cameras, uh, whether it's parked downtown or at a, a large event, it just brings a, a level of comfort uh, uh, that we've seen uh, make a positive impact, and we're excited to have two more as an addition to um, our toolbox. Uh, we updated the uh, police metric dashboard to uh, give this sort of information more so the public can look at it in real time. I think when I uh, started here in March, it was updated only to August of 2021. One of our civilians um, data analysts at the police department took the time to learn the uh, program, which no one else uh, was familiar with, and now she's updating it every month. Um, so uh, you can get the information, for example, that I provided today uh, on the publicly available website. Uh, one thing is for, I, I do like uh, crime data. One thing that I kind of pointed out as a problem really was that uh, there's no way to easily go into our system and determine how many people were shot. The aggravated assault numbers that I provide include not only individuals who are shot with a handgun, but also threatened with a handgun or stabbed or threatened with a knife or any other sort of weapon. So I think it's a important data metric when we're looking at gun violence. So I had our uh, software developer for the police department go in and he's going to try and make a change so that we can actually uh, track not only uh, murders with guns, but also shootings um, more easily. Um, and finally, as I've said several times, we're continuing, I'm continuing to evaluate um, the police department as a whole, and that's uh, policies, procedures, training, and deployments, and I look forward to uh, reporting back to the commission uh, at the end of July. Thank you. Uh, commission. Do you, Very good. Oh. Well, please. Yeah. Can I, Commissioner, may I ask a question? Please. Chief, thank you for the report. Um, I appreciate uh, the information that you gave on DICE. I think that's going to be very instrumental to the community, uh, especially within the Fuller Neighborhood Association area. I've received a number of different emails in reference to police response. So what are some of the things that you're going to be doing in reference to police responding to calls immediately if possible? Well, we do have a priority matrix that, uh, depending on what the call is, if it's something that uh, a delay in response can impact uh, the health or, or life of an individual, it's number one. If it's a uh, delay in response could impact uh, property damage potential, it's, it's number two, and it goes from there. So for example, a disorderly person's call, call with a you know, person making too much noise or a dog barking, that call will hold until any call with a potential for injury or serious property damage is attended to first. So uh, like many agencies around the area, we are challenged with personnel, but we've actually had, uh, we had two interviews yesterday, the week before, uh, we identified, I believe, six new recruit candidates. So we're filling our vacancies as fast as we can. Uh, we're getting them out of the academy, we're getting them on the road as fast as we can. And uh, as we fill those vacant spots, uh, which we're excited to, um, we just got seven officers off probation and they're on the street. So I think you'll see um, those numbers come down. Obviously the timing is difficult because it is summer. It is our busiest time, and so to come in with being shorthanded, it's, it is a challenge, but um, it's prioritizing. And as well, when we do uh, um, identify issues, for example, we've had some, some uh, specific issues downtown um, in some of the parks. We do have a small group of discretionary resources, our special response team, which uh, has been reported, you know, formerly was a full-time SWAT team. Now we use them um, for all, all sorts of things. And um, so when we identify uh, issues downtown, issues in the neighborhoods where people are, are, you know, are calling for enhanced response. That's a discretionary group of team that we can uh, that we can immediately go and move to that area. So, Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Commissioner. The questions. The questions for Chief. Okay. okay. I'll turn it over Please. to uh, Sergeant Horn, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Good afternoon, 
Thank, Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Sergeant Timothy Hornstra. I'm with the Grand Rapids Police K-9 Unit. I've been with the Grand Rapids Police for 24 years. I've had been in the K-9 Unit for 17 years, and I'm currently on my second dog. I'm also the K-9 Unit Supervisor. Uh, I was asked to come here and kind of give you guys a quick rundown of the K-9 Unit. Uh, we've had some social media. We just had a new one come up and stuff like that, so it's a great time to kind of brief you on what we have. The primary... Oh, the primary goal of the K-9 unit is officer and citizen safety, right? That's our primary goal of why we have the dogs out there. The secondary goals are suspect location and evidence recovery. Um, I'll go over some just quick, fast facts. We'll get you through this as quick as possible. Um, I will say if anybody's interested in meeting my dog, I have him down in the car, and so if afterwards you want to meet him, I'll glad we meet, bring him up here, and you guys can interact with him and everything else and uh, get to meet one. Uh, take pictures if you want to. Uh, canines are the only force option that once we deploy, we can call back, right? Our taser, our OC, our handgun, once it's deployed, there's no calling it back. If I deploy my dog on a suspect who's running away after he commits a bank robbery, and then the suspect decides the light bulb comes on, he's going to give up, I can tell my dog to stop, I can tell my dog to come back. Canines are the only tool on my belt that cannot be taken from me and used against me. Right? Dogs cannot, but he's not going to be used against me. Uh, our dogs are used in many of the most high risk incidents in the city. Despite this, most are resolved with any use of force. The mere presence of the canine is usually enough to keep a suspect from resisting and having the need for force. The, the dogs do an excellent job of de escalating, right? And people always ask, well, how is that possible? And I kind of explain it the way is if a bad guy looks at me, says, yep. I see him, I see his size, I see his physical nature. I'm gonna take my chances, I wanna, I wanna fight with that officer. They see that dog, a lot of times they will look at that dog and just that dog, they decide they are not gonna fight with the police canine, so they, they don't, so they give up. Just the mere presence of that dog being there is a major de-escalation tool. Um, the primary tool that we use on the dog is his nose. Um, everybody thinks that the primary thing we do is, is bite people, that they use their teeth primarily. Um, about 1% of the time does an application of a police canine result in someone being bit. So it's a pretty minor uh, event if someone's bit. That being said, when someone is bit, the injuries are very minor. Most are cleaned with uh, soap and water at the hospital. Anytime someone's bit, we automatically take them to the hospital. They get cleaned up with soap and water and a bandage and sent away. We pick all our dogs. They come uh, from, all of our current dogs come from overseas. They're green, so when we buy them from the kennel in Indiana, we bring them back up here. We spend eight weeks training them. We spend Monday through Friday, eight to five, and that's all we do is train these dogs. Once we're done doing that, they will be trained in patrol operations, which is tracking, building search, area search, article search, suspect apprehension, handler protection, and then ascent specialty. Right? Our dogs will be trained to either do narcotics detection or explosive detection. People ask, why don't you train them to do both? I need to know whether to pick up the package or run from the package. So if the explosive ones we run away from, the narcotics ones we pick up. We certify our dogs annually through an independent third party, right? So the International Police Work Dog Association, we attend a conference every year where we go down and we have people that are not with GRPD that actually look at our dogs and certify our dogs in all those categories that I mentioned earlier. Um, we do that just to kind of have a third party person look at our dogs and say, yep, they're trained, they're doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing. We encourage all of our handlers to continuously further their knowledge. It's not just a matter of taking your dog and training your dog. It's a matter of taking your dog, training your dog, and then working to increase your knowledge so that you can train your dog better and become a trainer or a master trainer so that you can pass that, that knowledge on so that you can get to those goals. Uh, we do thousands of demonstrations every year for people, right? So this last weekend, Saturday, we had four dogs, the K9K, which was a race. Uh, I think this week on Thursday, we're doing one for one of the local community organizations. We do a, a ton of community demonstrations, right? So we bring our kids into schools, we bring our kids into church, or our dogs into schools, into churches, into community groups, national night out, stuff like that. We are around all the time. We bring our dogs out and, and we encourage people to interact with them. They're a great public relations tool, right? 
People love dogs, they come up, they interact. Even the people that have some aversion towards dogs, these are very well trained dogs and it's a great tool that we can have people come up and explain to them you know, how to properly interact with a, a dog, whether it's our dog or even a, a, a stray dog so that they can help them so they're not being uh, injured. Uh, when they retire, people ask, what happens to the dogs after they retire? Um, the handler gets first option to purchase them. We purchase them for the, sil the city to relieve the liability from the city, right? And then they get to be uh, fat and happy on the couch, as I say it. So they just kind of come home and retire with us. My first dog retired in 2014 and retired at my house. Uh, he lived for two years after that, and then he passed away. Um, <clears throat> Right now we have four canine teams that are assigned to the tactical canine team. So we have eight teams total with GRPD and four are assigned to that. And they work directly with our special response team on any critical incident or high risk uh, incidents that they go to. Canine officers, we're, we're regular officers also, right? So we're out here, we're taking calls. It's not like uh, we're off waiting or something like that. So I'm, when I was a regular officer, I was taking normal calls just like everyone else. The canine is an additional duty. We're the only unit in the department where the additional duty requires the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is I take care of my police dog. During the day, I take care of the city's police dog. And the last thing I take care of before I go to bed is the city's police dog. And I do that seven days a week, and I absolutely love it. I wouldn't trade it for anything else and stuff. But this is the only unit that requires that. Other people that have um, specialized units, right? So if for say you, you're in the traffic unit and you take home your, your investigation stuff and you put it in the trunk of your car and you come back to work three days later, it's fine, right? No, with the dog, it is a 24 seven commitment. Everyone in this unit volunteers for it and they try really hard you know, to get into this unit. It's a very um, sought after position. Um, I'll give you some quick numbers. For the last three years, we've had 2,078 canine applications. So that could be everything from tracking, building search, narcotic search, article search, area search, so anything that they're trained to do. Out of those 2,000 plus applications, we had over 200 arrests, so we arrest people about 10% of the time when we deploy a dog. Out of that, we had 16 physical apprehensions, so that's 16 times the suspect was bit. Um, we had 508 tracks, 131 of those are successful. Uh, some people look at that number and they think, wow, that's kind of, it's like 25%, that's not that good. The national average is somewhere between 10 and 15%. Uh, the biggest enemy of the canine handler is a cell phone and someone getting picked up by a car. Our dogs are really good at tracking, but if someone gets in a car, you know, after they run from us and they get away, there's just nothing we can do. Um, we've had 651 high-risk operations, right, whether that's a track, working on homicide, aggravated assault, robbery, um, where we deployed the dog either in some manner to safely resolve that sit situation. Uh, our canine unit is also involved in uh, asset forfeitures when it comes to narcotics, right, so the drug dogs, they, they have seizures, um, about 64,000 in several vehicles in the last few years. Do you guys have any questions for me? I know I talked fast, but I was trying to get through it for you. Appreciate it. Any questions, colleagues? No? Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Our next item on the agenda is an update from the Office of Oversight and Public Accountability regarding uh, cure violence. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. As indicated, we'll be providing an update regarding the Cure Violence Program here in Grand Rapids. We're excited to have our partners, the Grand Rapids Urban League, present with us. Uh, to my right is Steve Jackson, who is the Site Director for Cure Violence Grand Rapids. Also with us today is Eric Brown, the CEO of the Urban League. Today we'll discuss uh, what is Cure Violence and how Cure Violence works. They'll also discuss a snapshot of Cure Violence activities within the last 30 days. They'll talk about recent violence interruption services and outcomes and provide a summary of some of those things, and then there will be time for questions. With that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Jackson. Good afternoon. Um, I want to give you kind of um, a little brief history of how Cure Violence came into being. Um, it started out with a, with a doctor by the name of Gary Slukin who left his practice and moved to uh, Western Africa where he was fighting two pandemics, uh, cholera and tuberculosis. So he had to come up with a new way to fight and slow that disease process. So what he did, he tr started to train people uh, to go into certain areas and they wanted to change behavior so they had to be 
trained on what not to do anymore to slow the stem of any kind of virus spreading. So the people that he sent into those areas, we now call them violence interrupters. Those violence interrupters went into neighborhoods, slowed the disease from spreading by following Mr. Slukin's directions on changing some uh, critical behaviors. Um, once those, those violent interrupters came out of those neighborhoods and went into different neighborhoods, he needed to build a secondary position to follow those case work, those case loads, which we now have outreach workers where they handled the cases. Uh, after 10 years of uh, working in um, Western Africa, he started to see 40 to 70 percent uh, improvement in, in treating um, disease that way. So upon his, after 10 years of being there, he went back to his hometown of Chicago needing a sabbatical and started watching the news and saw that Chicago had some of the worst gun violence crime in the nation. So he used those same uh, mapping techniques and overlaying maps onto neighborhoods so he can send in violent interrupters and outreach workers to slow the stem of violence in the city. So he started to get those same results that he had in Africa and started to see 40 to 70 percent decrease in crime. So that's kind of a little brief history of uh, how clear cure violence came into being. And, um, whoops. Um, I want to talk about a few little statistics. Uh, cure Violence Grand Rapids has engaged in over 1,679 interactions that led to violent interruptions. Now, 815 were very high-risk individuals, and 864 was a medium-risk individual. Cure Violence has also had 47 interactions that led to um, interruptions that served to diffuse immediate conflicts that or high risk and would have led to gun violence. Um, cure violence has also had interactions that led to mediations with key individuals in other conflicts that were not necessarily guns, but it could have been gun violence also. Um, cure violence, uh, what, what is cure violence? We kind of explained that, oh, I went to the wrong slide there. Um, over the last 30 days, Cure Violence has participated in the following community events. We started out uh, this past winter partnering with uh, Baxter Community, and on May 28th, we had our first uh, just kind of hot dogs and hamburger event at uh, Joe Taylor Park. Um, we've had two of our participants graduate. Um, they graduated on the 8th and the 9th of June. One graduated from the Kent County Detention Center and the other one graduated from adult ed. And we did hire one of those, uh, one of our participants. He is now on our staff and working out greatly. This is his first week and he's being trained this week. Um, if you didn't have a chance to go to Rock the Block event, I wanna tell you it was absolutely great. Uh, and if you were there, you probably saw me riding a scooter. So um, I just had a ball that particular day, so they should, they should look into Rock the Block almost every other weekend. So it was a really nice okay. event. Um, we've been partnering with New City Kids Music Event. Um, that's where they're on uh, Alpine Street, where we can take kids there and they can learn a different musical instrument. Uh, give them a little something different to do. Um, Grand Valley State University, a couple weeks ago, they put on uh, the Black Boys and Men Symposium. And we took our team down there. We learned an awful lot. Um, we had several great teachers. They gave us a few more things to put into our tool belt. Uh, we really enjoyed it. And um, on the night of the 16th, they actually had a sneaker ball. And I should have won it, but you know, I think um, next year we'll, uh, we'll see what I can do a little bit better there. So. Um, this past weekend, we uh, celebrated Juneteenth event with uh, the Baxter community again. The entire Urban League partnered with the Baxter community event. Uh, we had a tent, giveaways, food. Uh, it was a very nice time. Um, and I just want to tell you about something we do every other week. It's on Wednesday, so we'll be out there again tomorrow. 
We go out to the Kent County Youth Detention Center uh, every other Wednesday and we talk to kids that have either just arrived or we try to partner with kids that are coming out or so going to be out in a month or so so that we can get them in the program and try to steer them away from their previous uh, behaviors. Um, so in addition, over the last 30 days, Cure Violence has uh, kind of changed their schedule. We see what's going on out there. So we want to be out there a little bit more on Friday nights and Saturdays. Uh, so we're, we're going forward to midnight, changing up a little bit. Um, a lot of our high-risk uh, participants, we've enrolled them into uh, summer basketball. Um, we've got a big uh, kickoff this Thursday at King Park. Um, we've also allowed uh, some of our participants to, we just started, um, uh, we joined with, I believe, a Safe Alliances with, with Chris. And on Tuesday nights, we are doing basketball at uh, Plymouth Church. And then tonight actually is chess at um, Oakdale Church. So we're trying to get the kids a couple options just to keep them busy and keep their mind uh, on something positive. And the Urban League is, is uh, doing cookouts. So... Uh, on a Friday or Saturday night, you drive by Eastern, you'll be able to pick up a hot dog or a hamburger uh, and just talk to the community. We believe in uh, building inroads. We believe if you can break bread with a person, you can understand a person. Um, one of the great things about the Urban League and the community, once you're out there, is that we have some great wraparound services. Um, there's a big need for employment housing, education, and health and wellness, and we're there to provide, uh, provide that for the neighborhood. Um, one of the big things we learned about um, curing violence, um, we thought it was all about teenagers, um, but learning through social media, it's about middle school and fifth and sixth graders. We're spending more time into the middle schools and elementaries now than we do into the high schools. Um, hopefully that's something that we can, uh, we can change that as they, as they get a little bit older. Um, the Cure Violence team is fully committed to providing support to families and victims. Um, a lot of families have uh, lost loved ones in the last six months. We've attended social prayer We've attended uh, balloon visuals, and we've, uh, we've done everything we can to kind of keep the family straight. We do a lot of trauma-based training. We have a partner from Pine Rest that comes out every other Wednesday to help us with uh, learning the different <coughs> things you can do with trauma. And uh, it's been working out really good for our team. But we've helped our participants in so many different ways from uh, getting them to a doctor's appointment, uh, getting, getting them to their court dates. We had two, uh, two, uh, two of our members uh, attend court cases uh, for an entire week just to kind of balance out the two families. Um, we helped them in education, getting a driver's license, getting a social security card. Uh, we're doing whatever we can to get them to the next level. And even if that's helping to buy diapers, clothing, uh, and just personal hygiene products. We're trying to be there for that neighborhood. Uh, we spend a lot of time. Uh, we talk about a lot of the needs of the community and how it's impacted them. Um, the cure violence model, in my opinion, is it is working. It's a long-term investment um, that's going to help impact the disease of violence throughout the, the community of Grand Rapids. Um, and over the last eight months, um, we've, taken, uh, we've taken the community to different events, and we've had parents reach out to us, and they brought their kids into the Urban League, uh, asking for our help in changing their direction. Uh, we've had schools, Alger Middle School, reach out to us, amongst others, to come in and talk to their students and try to uh, bring down the gang violence in that particular school. Um, and we've come up with some great partners, as I mentioned earlier, Pine Rest, Family Outreach, Arbor Circle, and Arbor Circle has an excellent youth program that we are using in order to connect some of the youth um, with whether it's basic needs or if it's just a counselor. 
And we, uh, we recently, I recently met uh, some people at Catherine's Health Center, and they're going to partner with us on the same thing. I believe trauma is one of the biggest things out there, and both of those organizations uh, are going to help us with some trauma training. Now, this is a short part of our presentation. We have a, a bigger meeting on July 26 with you, but if you have any questions at this time, I will gladly answer any of those questions for you. Very good. Thank you, sir. Uh, any questions? Yes, Chris. I really commend Cure Violence for what they're doing in their community. It's just awesome. But I, I wondered, though, you talked about you had some um, interactions with high-risk individuals. Um, do you ever call the police in when, when you have these kind of interactions? Do you ever need a police assistance? I know that the goal is, to, is not to bring them in, but right. at times do you have to? It's funny you say that. Um, sometimes I text the chief at 1 in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, I've talked to Christine, and I believe it's Jeffrey. So, yes, we have conversations around it, yes. But you don't, you don't call them in when, during, during those interactions? Uh, it's kind of, it seemed to seem kind of scary to me. Not, <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it can be scary. Yeah. Um, because sometimes the kids have guns on them, and we don't allow guns on the Urban League property, so yeah. they have to leave their guns in the car. Um, but if it's something that the police needs to know, mm -hmm. uh, we have some ways to get getting in hold of them. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Yep. Yep. Sir. Thank you, sir, um, for this report. I appreciate talking with you last week. We had a great conversation. Yep. What I want to ask is that, are you primarily dealing with teenagers and adults with cure violence as well? And what is the real core issue of the violence in reference to the shootings that are taking place, especially within my ward? Uh, yes, yes, we do do. We are dealing with young adults, teenagers. But um, like I said earlier, we are finding middle schools and grade schools. We have a participant that's eight years old, um, a couple of them, I think. Um, so we are finding kids of all ages and, and colors and everything else. Um, I think um, you, you asked the question of what's, what's stirring it, I guess. Uh, I'd have to say it's, it's been building probably for 40 or more years. This is something more generational. Um, that's why I look at trauma as being one of the things I think could, um, could handle it. When I talk to Arbor Circle and Catherine's, we talk about bringing in a family um, to actually sit down and talk. Like, for instance, last week there was, um, there was three teens shot, so we were trying to get those families in. But it's kind of hard for families sometimes. They don't want to accept the word um, counseling or mental health. So we got to figure out, and that's what I was talking to Arbor Circle this morning about, I have to figure out different terminology, and my team will too, in terms of uh, getting people in. I think that's one of the true ways that we can uh, probably counter a lot of violence is we got to get them in as quick as possible in order to de-escalate everything. I hope, I hope that answered everything. Yeah, I'm sure we'll be talking some more because yes, I got some yes, information for you that you've asked for. Yeah, okay. Oh, appreciate that. Thank you. Questions? Merle? I think, it's, is this your second or third year in operation? This is our first eight months. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I just wonder, looking ahead, if you're finding uh, financial support for stability of the program because this, as you mentioned, is a long-range program. It is long a long-range range program, yes. And we are finding um, the the proper financial uh, support. Um, I guess we could always be supported more. Um, but uh, yes, I'd say the answer to that is yes. If I may. Yes, sir. Recently, we were able to secure uh, in a federal earmark to support the full funding of Cure Violence over the next, uh, over this coming fiscal year. So there has been additional support. And the city commission in this new budget cycle also allocated additional resources towards Cure Violence. Thank you. Thank Good you. to hear. Mr. Jackson, I uh, am looking forward to the uh, to taking a good hard look at the evaluation uh, once that 
that first year is complete. And, and once you, or, or I guess, you know, from your time there thus far, and, and as we're seeing the, uh, the increase in, uh, in community violence, um, what are just, I guess, some of the takeaways that you have uh, in terms of what you're, what you're seeing? Um, I know that, again, we're looking at, we're talking about something that is uh, happening not just in Grand Rapids, but throughout the country. Um, and just really, again, curious to see or hear uh, some, of the, some of the takeaways that you have thus far. You know, I was, um, I guess I was kind of surprised by the amount of hopelessness you see. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of kids out there that are raising themselves. Um, I can't think of a lack of a better word for that, not to put the blame on the parent or anything like that, but it's just reality. Mm -hmm. That's what we see when they come into the Urban League. Uh, we picked up one of our participants as he was, um, he was going through our parking lot, opening up doors, trying to find change so he could get something to eat. Mm -hmm. um, we have mapped out uh, food pantries one mile circle around the urban league so that families know where to go you can get food within that one mile area from um uh, it's like 12 different pantries that you can get it monday through saturday there is uh, but a lot of people didn't know that so that's one of, that was one of the first things we did and that's believe it or not that helped that helped a lot of people um and a lot of the kids now granted kids don't uh want to go home and cook and uh, cook corn on the cob or whatever it may be. Uh, they would prefer just to have pizza, but um, I think it goes back a little further. I think about when I was in the eighth grade and they made us take home ec. Mm -hmm. They made us learn how to cook. And I've been cooking ever since, and as you can see, I haven't missed a whole lot of meals. <laughs> so uh, I think it should bring, we should, it, our, our approach should include the school system, which we do work with the school system, we are, we are big advocates to get kids back into school. But I think the approach should be um, the school system, the city, um, nonprofit organizations, and clergy. I think you need all four of those working to really bring down violence. And you have to build up families again. So. That don't don't forget the business community. The business community, too. Yep, that's exactly it. Very good. Mr. Brown, did you have something? Yeah, excuse me, if I could just add, it goes a little bit, and Steve, you're walking right there, it goes a little bit to Commissioner Moody's question. Um, in addition to what Cure Violence can provide, as, as Chief said earlier, the police, the public safety is is one, one method, Cure Violence is another method or another means of dealing with the violence. It does take the whole community. Um, what I really wanted to bring out was we have to look at the underlying causes of what are leading these young people to, to violence. Income, they don't have income, There's, they have a lack of hope. And let me, let me backtrack. 2007, there was a report. We had to uh, stop the violence thing. Commissioner, you're very familiar with that. 2007, I think former Commissioner White and Williams maybe led that uh, committee. One of the top things that came out of that from youth was that they had a lack of hope. They didn't see a future here in Grand Rapids. Fast forward to 2017, I think it was. And same thing, where violence is up. The, one of the top rising things, there were like seven, uh, 14 or so different things that were suggested out of that report that needed to happen. 2017, almost a repeat. The kids don't have hope. They don't see a future here in Grand Rapids. A lot of it has to do with economic situations. Now we're in 2022. We did a report 2020. We commissioned um, a report to interview 90, almost 90 youth that were involved in some face, form, shape, or fashion uh, with violence. And by and large, they came up with four areas. They needed uh, opportunities for income uh, or employment opportunities, educational opportunities, in school, as Steve mentioned, in school and out of school opportunities. And they needed a safe place to be able to be able to fellowship with their friends, their family, um, parents, and other positive adults. So if we're going back, that's over 15, 20 years, and it hasn't changed, Steve said, decades. So cure violence is, is, is one thing. It's not the panacea. It's long term. But until we can look at some of those underlying causes of the income dis, uh, disparities, housing disparities, one in six homeless uh, African-American youth, as well as educational disparities, we're going to continue to see that we're going to have this ongoing issue around violence. Very good. Got one other question, uh, and that is, I know that, again, one of the 
One of the things that attracted me most to uh, Cure Violence was that, in fact, that was that it was evidence-based. And so, uh, what is the interaction uh, with, um, I guess, Cure Violence International, which is the, I guess, the mothership in Chicago in terms of they they are the ones who are the content experts. They are more or less, you know, providing the insight, the you know, the the direction to go. How, how has that been? Uh, simply because, you know, I, I, I would think that from time to time. Perhaps the thinking is we know what's best for our community, and that I think can can create some tension when you have something that's evidence based. So just wondering about that. Oh, I'm sorry, I got distracted for two a second. <laughs> Being a former accountant, I love the data part of that. That's mm -hmm. one thing that I, like yourself, really love about this program. It really. Um, digs into the data. There's various modules. We have to do an assessment on the participants. Um, our staff, our outreach workers have to log in all their activity. Um, there's a briefing every day. Or there's a debriefing every day. So it's based on every. It, we do. It's a very uh, data-driven, evidence-based, ev evidence-driven program so that we're using the data. We all understand that. It's, it's very scientific in their approach in this, and that's how I think they can espouse to have the reduction in violence that they do. I mean, we were trending the right way. Um, you know, the data is there. Again, give us some time to uh, uh, on-ramp this a little bit more. But it is very data uh, heavy, and we are constantly looking at where the hotspots are um, what, um, and, and infusing that into the programs, the data programs. They're inputting on a daily basis what's happening with their interaction with the various participants. Um, so we do use data very heavily uh, in the Cure Violence program. Very good. Do you okay. add to that? No, no, you said it perfectly. Very good. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Yep. The next item on the agenda is an update from the SAFE Task Force. All right. Good afternoon, colleagues. Good afternoon. Um, I have a hard time capturing your attention as I don't know what his or her name is, but um, <laughs> we heard the loud panting, so th uh, thanks for all the updates so far. My name is Melinda Sassi. I'm one of the commissioners. I know many of you, but I, today I get to talk about um, SAFE an organization task force that's really meaningful to me as I started on this journey back when I was a resident volunteer in 2013. And so to hear the presentation about cure violence is also really important because that was one of the strategies that was looked at during that time. So um, congrats to all involved. Um, you know, think about eight months and there's a lot that's been done. So here's an overview of who's on our task force. I think the important thing to know, as was mentioned, I think Eric mentioned it, there's not one silver bullet. We know that there needs to be a number of strategies involved to engage and to reduce violence, and particularly with young people. And yes, that, that age, we're continuing to see it as it relates to the task force as well. You know, I think before it was 16 to 24, then it got moved to 14 to 24, then it's 11, now we're hearing eight and nine. Um, but our task force is really made up of individuals um, from the city, but also our school system, um, community health, um, you know, a very appreciative of our uh, Kent County prosecutor who has continued to be engaged even during a very busy time um, in his office uh, associated with SAFE, as well as other um, members of really grassroots neighborhood associations that are trying to work together to reduce gun violence in our community. And I want to say thank you to Mr. Kane, who is our staff liaison and keeps us on track, as well as um, uh, DC Reifenberg from our police department. So you can see it's a variety of individuals who serve on this task force. Um, so much of the focus of our work has been to identify what are some of those grassroots community-based groups doing that have very high relationship oriented um, either investments or programs. Um, they might be engaged in grant work to help to reduce violence and even, um, oh, are you, are you doing that, Asante, or is that me? <laughs> okay. Um, and so I just, I'll, I'll tee him up for just discussion of our most recent uh, task force um, and pitch highlight night that we held at Ottawa Hills High School. And I think what you'll see is a variety of individuals who are focused on pro-social activities for youth, looking at root cause pieces associated with things that um, continue to have an impact to gun violence, like our domestic violence situations, and um, um, organizations that are looking to connect neighbors to one another so that we can build high trusting relationships. 
Thank you, Commissioner Isasi. Uh, as uh, the commissioner was saying, um, there is no one silver bullet, and that's what we've seen in the SAFE Task Force. And so there's a variety of programs that um, the task force uh, has funded over the years. I'm going to go through this, this recent uh, batch of uh, pitch and highlight night winners. Um, most of these, as far as the um, reporting out and outcomes achieved, uh, will be reported um, probably to this body in June or July with one group um, later in, in August. Um, but we had the We Matter Now conference. It was a one-day conference that provided conflict resolution, problem solving, and self-efficacy uh, training for youth. Um, very uh, positive um, men, role models, um, a, a part of that organization that um, kind of combined their skills and, and abilities to uh, bring different programming to youth. Um, we have Mused. Um, I have a video that I can share with this uh, committee um, shortly, um, but uh, they've been funded in the past before. Uh, previously, um, they uh, had a music-based program. This is an opportunity for them to uh, expand their offerings um, to the community. Um, they're located on, on Leonard Avenue, and I think I saw a sign that they were um, opening up on the southeast side, too, another another space um, on, on Eastern. So um, the the expansion that SAFE helped them do was, was a, a photography program, and so um, they're busy with that. Um, we have the Grand Rapids Center for Community Transformation who completed their work in the in the winter. That was a basketball league, a basketball uh, series of basketball tournaments. Um, we have the neighborhood associations coming together um, to have a Safe Street, Safe Neighborhoods program to talk about um, gun safety and um, to do a, a campaign around the city to help people understand the, the dangers of guns and that there's opportunity to be safer with the firearms that people choose to have in their, in their, in their homes if they want. Um, we have Puertas that uh, who um, uh, do counseling services uh, like previous people spoke about as far as um, strengthening the family. Um, uh, um, this uh, group here um, found that, um, that there were some opportunities, um, uh, especially um, through bilingual education of, uh, of persons on how to uh, uh, get through the trauma that, that some of these participants have uh, endured. Um, very excited about that, that effort. And then we have Freedom Elevated Defense Solutions. Still working on this one, actually. Um, but this gentleman here um, was um, to offer firearms safety training um, to the community. Um, so uh, those are the current projects that are um, happening right now, and I just want to list some of the outcomes that uh, were, were uh, recorded um, in their agreements that we had with them. So everything from uh, surveys on uh, how people have um, um, learned or grown um, when it comes to expressing themselves or uh, increase or decrease social responsibility, developing healthy relationships with peers, um, also um, uh, explaining what the difference in the grant made in the community of the population that that, that, that particular group serves. So there's a number of outcomes there that are listed. Um, and we also ask them to document those outreach efforts that they do um, also. So I'll leave that for you to um, read later. But um, there are outcomes that are associated with these programs. Um, this morning at the fiscal committee, um, a uh, resolution was accepted at that committee for a 2022 gun buyback. Um, we had a gun buyback in 2021. We had three levels of uh, different firearms that um, we were accepting um, this year um, to be closer on target to the firearms that um, are uh, used in crimes. Um, we're only doing two tiers. So tier one would be assault rifles, semi-automatic handguns, and tier two, um, revolvers, shotguns, and rifles. Um, Previously, we held one in 2020 with the FY20 in the FY21 fiscal year, and here you'll see the results of that: the tier one, tier two, and tier three. So, um, the least valuable in this situation of firearms were the tier three firearms, and we collected 17 of those. But for the tier one, tier two, the assault rifles, semi-automatic handguns, revolvers, shotguns, rifles, we that was the vast majority of them. Um, uh, so uh, the 267 firearms were disposed of through that uh, process. So we're looking forward. Um, if the final approval is given at the um, committee uh, at the city commission meeting tonight, we'll um, get this uh, program started. Um, another thing we did in the same room um, on I want to say in March, we had a, a safe gathering. Where you want to speak on this? Yeah. Oh. 
Well, kind of, you stepped up. Like, <laughs> um, a, 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 a safe gathering where we um, invited people that were previous winners of uh, the safe pitch and highlight night, uh, previous people who had um, expressed an interest in, in, in safe, and also some of those community partners, those grassroots organizations. So um, you had uh, uh, the prosecutor's office there, the new police chief, um, he, he came in and listened. Um, we had uh, counselors, people from all different backgrounds. But I think the key thing that um, um, intersects all these particular groups are these are pe these are the people that are actually there um, doing the work, um, affected by the work in their in their daily work lives, um, trying to uh, make a difference in our community to make for a safer uh, community. So. Um, out of that meeting, we had some good discussion, and, and that's going to help form some of the things that the Safe Task Force concentrates um, on in the, in, the, in the future. And one theme, though, that I will bring up that echoes some of the stuff that was he uh, heard earlier today was that this group also thought that there was lots of opportunity to help strengthen the families. Um, that was something that um, through the Family Outreach Center and Realism is Loyalty that we've done in the past, um, where they had parenting programs, where there's built-in counseling, and some of those same struggles about um, getting people um, interested in counseling and whatnot and those terms that people are turned off by. Um, what we found is um, through those partners, um, you know, it, it really made a difference. And so you had people, because uh, at least for Realism is Loyalty, they had two sets of programs. And the people that were in the first portion of the program, when their time ended, they're like, hey, well, we want more of this. And so um, they extended the program. And I, 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 I think the task force also agrees that um, strengthening the family, strengthening parenting um, is, is an opportunity for us all. Um, yeah, go ahead, ma'am. So I'll just add to that. Um, I think the, the turnout for that event was much greater than we expected. Um, I think, Chief, that was, I don't remember, I think it might have been the second to the last month of March. And um, I know there were a number of people that you had not had yet had the chance to meet and also other groups that had not met each other. I think one of the one thing that I do want to highlight is specifically a focus that I will see SAFE um, engaged in is working with the prosecutor to identify um, groups of individuals, usually said I think it's anywhere between 15 to 20 individuals, where he's really looking to divert out of the adult um, system, um, but that there might not be spots where he can necessarily put them or programs. And so um, I think one of the best things that came out of that, and that will be, we've, we've had this yearly, and I think we'll need to review now that we're a little um, more in an endemic phase to do this twice a year, um, but to identify how can we very tactically take individuals, divert them out of the adult system, put them into a program um, that has been engaged either with SAFE or maybe it's one that hasn't been, but they're doing this grassroots and neighborhood community work and hopefully have them on a path where then they can be diverted from that long-term impact of our criminal legal system. So I'd be happy to answer any questions that the uh, Public <coughs> Safety uh, Committee has. Okay. Colleagues, any questions? Thank you, um, colleague Commissioner Yasasi and Mr. Kane. Can you just give us a brief description of some of the organizations that you are partnering with besides Cure Violence that was given a report today? Uh, well, the, the, the groups in the, the, the... Yeah, I can go back to the slide. Should I name the people? Let me see. Yeah, so the, all of these groups here, um, which are in the report, but uh, besides that are listed in here, I guess I'd say... Um, Prosecutor's Office, Police Department, obviously, Urban League of West Michigan. Uh, Mr. Brown is um, coming to our meetings now. Um, Kirby Kellingham from the Family Outreach Center, um, and also a, a Seeking Safety uh, counselor there. Um, we have uh, Larry Johnson from Grand Rapids Public Schools, um, Neighborhood Association members, uh, commissioners, uh, Richard Griffin, who is a, a returned citizen, who uh, does um, work in that space. Um, um, trying to change people's lives, and we have our community's children with Shannon Harris. Um, there's a, there's lots of different people that are working uh, with with the Safe Task Force, and we're always looking for new partners. Thank you. I just wanted you to read that to get it on public record that it yes, came sir. straight out of your mouth. Yes, sir. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody else? Colleagues? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks yeah. for sure. And if there. Oh, so Go ahead, please. Oh, I was just going to say that that's all from um, from the public safety groups that were here yep. um, today, and we look forward to uh, engaging um, in future uh, meetings with you all. Very good. I got one more question, Commissioner yes. Jones. Um, I noticed there's no businesses on this list. Have you considered contacting with other businesses organizations as well? 
I uh, will come back just as strong as the police chief came when he came in and started and said hey, the statistics he's going to give you. I'll have to think about that, but I'm sure there's some businesses that we have worked with, and I'll let you know that at the next meeting, sir. No, no, what I, what I mean is that are the businesses that you can work with. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 we can work with all types of business. I mean, we work with um, Elijah Libet. I mean, he has a, 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 a food catering place there on Eastern. Um, we've worked with him in the, in, the, in the past. But, yes, businesses are also welcome, sir. Um, and what I was trying to respond to is if, if you need a list or would like a list of those businesses, I can, I can get that to you, sir, on who we've worked with in the past. No, I just want to make sure that businesses are contributing, are giving. Oh, uh, we are partnering with them in different ways, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Ask me. I got some friends. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any others? Colleagues? No? Okay. With that, uh, we'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you.